Good morning. Uh, welcome to the House Ways and Means Committee. I call it this committee meeting to order and note for the record that a quorum is present. So our first order of business is the approval of the minutes from Monday, April 17th, 2023. Vice Chair Edelson, could I get a motion for approval of the minutes? That's my motion, Madam Chair. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say no. The motion prevails and the minutes are adopted. So today our plan is again we have same time time constraints we've had we will have all week which is the floor session and so what we're going to do is we're going to do three bills which will all be combined together um, as we have done before to merge the bills to match up with the Senate structure to go to conference committee and so the first bill for today is House File 2755. Representative Nelson, and as you make your way down to the, the table, I will move that House File 2755 before the, is before the committee. And welcome, Representative Nelson. And I will also move the A12 amendment to get the bill in the shape the author desires. Any discussion to the A12 amendment? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say no. The motion prevails and the A12 amendment is adopted. So to your bill, Representative Nelson. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Um, House file 2785 is the labor and industry um, bill for this year, the, the funding bill. Um, we had an $8 million over base target, which we met um, funding the Department of Labor and Industry. Um, Article one of the bill is the funding portion of it. Article two is the uh, is the Ag and Food Processors Worker Protection Bill, which came out came from uh, represent House File 70 from Representative Hansen. Article three is the Nursing Home Workforce Standards Board. Uh, Article four is the Refinery Safety Bill. Article five was upgrades to the Combative Sports Regulations and lowering some fees there for uh, for some of the people that participate in that. <coughs> Uh, Article 6 is a bunch of miscellaneous provisions, and the first one creates, it splits the Department of Apprenticeship, or the Division of Apprenticeship off from the Division of Labor Standards, and creates its own separate Division of Apprenticeship. Um, it also adds to a labor ed and advancement grants, it adds tribal individual people and tribal governments to those who are eligible for these grants. It requires the DLI to recreate um, a poster for vets benefits and services that it, employers above a certain level can have to post, brings our, our OSHA fines into compliance with federal standards, insurancing, ensuring we can maintain um, federal funding for MinOSHA. Um, it creates a, an ergonomic standards board within the Department of Labor and Industry. And this is important because repetitive injuries are things that cause people to get injured and be off the job. This, we can get to the, uh, figure out ways to prevent those preventive injuries through ergonomics. We have less workers getting injured. Um, it lowers the cost of reinstatement for various licenses. It adds language to the residential construction um, um, licensing that allows electric, you know, yeah, allows electric, uh, solar contractors to be part of the, uh, of the residential construction, which allows consumers to have access to the contractor recovery fund when they what they have, end up having work done by a shoddy contractor. It adds language for electric vehicle charging stations for new residential multi-unit construction to the building codes, instructs the commissioner to adopt rules for window cleaning safety and adult, and adult changing tables through the construction code process. And the window cleaning safety has been a something that's been on our, our radar for a few years about some concern about some, some buildings where that's required, they can never be used. And this has the Department of Labor and Industry look at those and come up with rules that make more sense for those people. Um, Article 7 of the board, is it, it uh, funds the Public Employee Relations Board which uh, we've had on the books for a few years that uh, Representative Lyndon Carlson brought, for, brought back into existence. But we've never funded it more than just having one person in the office. This allows funding for the board to get up and running and so that they can deal with those issues with the public employees and public employers. Um, Article 8 is the Meatpacker Safety Bill. 
and Article 9 is the Warehouse Worker Safety Bill. And with that, Madam Chair, that's, that's the bill. I'll stand for questions. Thank you, Representative Nelson. Discussion to House File 2755. Representative Scott. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Are, are we going to be adopting the A12? We did already. Oh, we did? Yes. Oh. Oh, you're welcome. That was super fast. I actually paused for a long time and I looked oh, over to that sorry. side of that I was, aisle to I was check to make sure. I so, yep, no, nope, that's chair. okay. So, wanted, we have adopted the amendment. So, if you want to speak to that portion, you know, now would be totally fine to do that. Okay, Scott. perfect. Um, yeah. I'm just wondering, Madam Chair, if the author could explain the A12. Just lots of numbers in there. Let's see. Yeah. What Representative about. Nelson. Madam Chair and members, the A12, I was ready to do that, but it went so quick that anyway, the A12 increases funding for OSHA. In the division of, uh, as a division of De Department of Labor and Industry, um, to add more um, OSHA inspectors, and this is not coming out of a general fund. This is coming out of the, uh, um, I got it here, but the, the workers' compensation fund. And this thing, we've heard in our committee a lot about there not being enough OSHA inspectors from the GOP side of the of the committee concern about why isn't OSHA getting out there. This allows the Department of Labor and Industry to o hire more OSHA inspectors so we can get out to work sites to make sure that they're safe for the workers. Representative Scott. Thank you, Madam Chair. And um, just pivoting here a little bit, um, Article 5, the combative sports piece, um, Representative Nelson, <clears throat> was that heard in committee? Representative Nelson. It was heard, yes, it was heard in the committee as, as part of the original bill 2755, which was the governor's budget bill. And it was heard in that. And this is upgrading the rules and again, lowering some of the fees for participants in combative sports. Representative Scott. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I don't know if any of our, anyone else has questions um, about the, um, this bill, um, but if I don't know, I'll just I'll just kind of give my summary here since I'm Representative acting. Scott, and, and Representative Petersburg just raised his hand. I know you're kind of playing lead today a little yeah. bit, so I could come back to you. If okay, you wanted perfect. To, okay, Representative Petersburg. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And I noticed mm -hmm. that you stopped the description of the bill at section at Article Nine. You didn't contact uh, comment on Article Ten, uh, which is the, the worker construction um, wage protections. And so I was inquiring if if there are key areas in that particular section that are important as well. Representative Nelson. Thank you, Madam Chair. And that's, that was my mistake uh, as I was going through it. Article 10 is the construction worker wage protection. It deals with some things we have passed in the f past few years, wage protection and, and misclassific strong work misclassification of workers uh, statutes. This is just closing a couple of loopholes that have come up. And it's important that we make sure that workers as they as they work, that they're being properly classified and properly paid, and that they get they get paid the money that they, they were promised and that they're owed from their work that they have done. Representative Petersburg. Uh, thank you, and, and in that regards, I'm trying to remember, I've been reading a lot of bills lately. Uh, <laughs> it seems to me that there's something in here in which uh, we're getting a little pushback from contractors being required um, to be liable for uh, pay for subcontractors and sub subcontractors is that in your bill as well representative Nelson yes madam chair that's part of, that's part and parcel of the uh, work, worker protection of article 10 representative Petersburg uh, thank you and that's that has a little bit of a concern because when a subcontractor um, uh, it, it's it's like anybody else, you know, you, you hire somebody to do a job and you hold, expect them to be held accountable for that. And uh, you could do all the due diligence you want uh, and you could even pay them to do their job. And now we're gonna be holding them liable if they choose to uh, defraud others. Isn't that a little bit onerous uh, for contractors to, to have to figure out the sub subcontractors, et cetera, all the way down to the bottom of the list? Representative Nelson. Madam Chair and members, this is part of this is part of uh, making sure workers get paid properly. That putting it is putting a little bit of onus on the general contractors to make sure that when they hire subcontractors, they know who they're hiring and they know that they're they're paying their people properly. Representative Petersburg. Thank you, and, and I'll leave it at that. But sometimes uh, they may have confidence in the subcontractor, but they don't know that the subcontractor is subbing out from, from their work as well sometimes. And so it's, it makes it difficult. And uh, I, I agree. I, I mean, I think we need to 
have everybody be able to get paid. Uh, I'm just concerned about the uh, onerousness of that particular provision. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Madam Chair. Further discussion to the bill? Representative Scott. Um, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Representative Nelson, um, the, this bill is setting up a, I believe it's a nine person uh, nursing home workforce standards board um, with enormous rulemaking uh, and uh, authority. And is there a provision in the bill that says whatever this board comes up with that they have to report that back to the legislature and the legislature has to approve or disapprove before any action is taken? Representative Nelson. Madam Chair, members, again, that's house that came out of House File 908, which which is Representative Abadje's bill. Um, I believe that there's their they're, they're set the board set the board is, it looks at that and the idea is to make sure that um, we have standards there so that similar to what we did with nurses keeping uh, uh, keeping work in the nurses safety bill we passed a few years ago making sure that the workplace is safe for the for the nursing home workers and uh, bringing that bringing that stuff forward so that we can make sure that again people go to go home from work at the end of the day in the same condition they came to work Representative Scott. Thanks, uh, Madam Chair. And Representative Nelson, that wasn't my question. My question was, this board comes up with recommendations, and what authority do they have? Do they have more authority to implement those regulations than the legislature? Or does, if they come up with a regulation, do they have to first pass it through us? Representative Nelson. Madam Chair and members, I believe they have to, they have to pass it through us. Um, could you point... Representative Scott. Thank you, Madam Chair. Could you point to the page in line that expressly says that um, representative uh, Nelson representative Nelson and I'm gonna add, I'm gonna phone a friend here from the, friend. Com the commissioner <laughs> commissioner Great. welcome to the committee commissioner please introduce yourself for the record and proceed thank you madam chair my name is Nicole Blissenbach and I serve as the commissioner of the Department of Labor and Industry um, to Representative Scott's question, uh, the board would be tasked with uh, looking at and adopting uh, rules that would relate to the standards for nursing home workers. Representative Scott. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. So, uh, Ms. Blizenbach, so there's nothing in the bill that says that whatever they come up with has to be um, kind of affirmed by the legislature or discussed in the legislature? Commissioner Blissenbach. Um, Madam Chair, Representative Scott, uh, no, that, that is the, the, they would be adopting rules similar to how an agency adopts rules through the rulemaking process. Representative Scott. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So we're setting up um, a government, a governor appointed nine person panel with rulemaking authority um, for regulating an industry that is on the verge of collapse. And we're saying that doesn't have to pass through the legislature. It's just this autonomous um, board that's abdicating legislative responsibility. And we're going to put even more layers of regulation on the nursing home industry. Um, I think that is wrongheaded. It's, I think this board gets $2 million. Um, the, I think the total funding so far for nursing homes this session is, what, four or five, something like that? What are we doing here? Do we not care about the patients in, in the beds? Um, the best thing we could do is pay the people more that work in the nursing homes so that they don't leave and go to McDonald's or um, work at Hobby Lobby. Um, we, we are forgetting the value of the lives of the people that are in these nursing homes. And we're not going to have any place pretty soon <laughs> to put our, our elderly folks. And that is very concerning. I sure hope that the Democrats, the Democrat majority before this session is out does something to help the folks in the nursing home. And I know, Representative Nelson, you would say that, well, we're, these people are going to be trained better and they're not going to have injuries and all that. Well, the proof is in the pudding on that. But um, the best thing we can do is pay them more, um, not put them into um, what looks like the precursor to unionizing them. So, Madam Chair, I cannot, 
I cannot support this bill for that very reason. And I'm going to encourage my colleagues to vote no as well. Thank you. Thank you. Any further discussion to House File 2755? Rep Representative Agbadje and then Liebling. Or Liebling? Okay. You both had your hands up roughly at the same time. So Representative Liebling. All right. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. And I just want to um, respond really briefly to, to one thing. And I'm not on the Human Services Committee this year, so I don't know what um, is, is being done, but I, I suspect that Chair Noor is quite uh, up on it. But I do want to just say that there is a little misconception that's been floated. You know, when, um, when funding is in the, uh, when we have um, funding that occurs by operation of law, as we do for nursing facilities, even if you don't put a dollar in a bill, it doesn't mean that they're not getting increased funding. I just really want to make that point. Nursing facilities are paid by quote unquote, value-based reimbursement. It may not be perfect, but they do get constant increasing funding in the base, uh, in the forecast, um, without ever a dollar going in a bill. So anything that goes in a bill is on top of that. So that's all I wanted to say. <laughs> Representative Agbeje. Thank you, Chair Olson. Thank you, Representative Nelson. Um, again, I think we've been working hard on this. A provision that most people have been recently talking about and apologies for being a couple minutes late. I will just say that the Nursing Home Workforce Standards Board, I mean, I do think it's it's a step in the right direction of where labor should be going. Um, it's something that really helps the workers ensure that they have a voice alongside the employer and alongside the regulators because what we're doing there is we're ensuring that that group of people understands how to best spend the money, as Representative Liebling just noted, that that money is going to continue to come in. Um, and we do want to make sure that they're being paid at the best possible rate, that they're being paid um, in a way that measures up with the experience that they have, and that we're hiring people who have the experience that we need to care for our loved ones who are in long-term long care facilities. So. Um, I know that we're here mostly to talk about money, but you know this piece I do think helps us ensure that that money is distributed in a way that supports the workers, supports the long-term care facilities, supports the people who live there. Um, so that way we're taking care of our most vulnerable in our communities, and we're also ensuring that the people who are most affected by this have a voice in how that money is distributed. So thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Noor. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, Chair Liebling, for bringing the conversation uh, about the value-based reimbursement. Just wanted to note that within the value-based reimbursement for the next four years, there's $853 million that is already included, focused, budgeted, which is going to go to the nursing homes. That's the fact, and people need to understand this is a value-based reimbursement that we adopted. And quite frankly, I think there's so many other challenges we'll be talking about this, I am sure, during the conversation about the human services uh, bill, budget bill discussion. Thank you. Further discussion? Seeing no further discussion, last word on your bill, Representative Nelson. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. And again, this bill, basically the overarching theme of this, of this bill is worker safety, making sure that people can go home from work at the end of the day in the same condition they came to work in the morning, but just a little bit tired from working, putting in a good day's work. Great, thank you for your work. And with that, I will move that House File 2755 as amended be laid over. Thank you, Representative Nelson. So our next bill today is House File 2233, Representative Zhang, the Workforce Development Budget Bill. So welcome to the committee as you get yourself set there. I will move that House File, <coughs> excuse me, 2233 be moved before the committee. And I will have you go over your bill and then you have an amendment of the A15 amendment, and then we're going to lay over the bill, but we won't actually take action on the A15 amendment because we are going to move that the A15 amendment was drafted to the DE that will go on to the larger budget bill. So stick with me here. Um, and so what we'll have you do is we'll do your bill. We'll take up the A15. We won't vote on it. We'll bring the A15 back later. So if you could just hang around um, in case there are questions when we get to that point. But just 
especially for our GOP colleagues, make sure you kind of understand that, that we'll have discussion of the A15, um, but we won't actually take uh, a vote on it at the moment. So with that long introduction to your bill, Representative Jean. Thank you, Madam Chair. This bill has two articles. The first article is on appropriations, and the second article is on workforce development. And so uh, this bill was put together by listening to hundreds of community mem members from all corners of our state who came to share their stories about their struggles and how we can or have supported them through the years with our workforce funds. Uh, this bill will be a historical investment in our people and infrastructure for generations to come. It creates a new competitive grant uh, pro creates new com competitive grant programs at DEED uh, that provide additional resources for job training and establishes the uh, Office of New Americans that will lead the state's effort to effectively integrate workers into our workforce and entrepreneur system. This bill also um, will provide direct appropriations to many well-established uh, community organizations like Summit Academy and Clues that have a history of preparing Minnesotans for good jobs. It includes uh, provisions from our Greater Minnesota members, uh, represent, Representatives Petersburg and Baker, that will help so many people. It also includes provisions from other members that uh, will help those who come from historically disadvantaged communities, do not have, uh, who, do, who do not have training um, and opportunities. Uh, and so this um, may have, when it comes, both skilled and unskilled laborers. So it, it will ensure to close the skills gap with heavy investment in building capacity for people to train others. Uh, this is how we can ensure that uh, a rising tide lifts all ships in the harbor and it's a realization of equity and practice. It also, this bill also provides a $21 million in new funding for the vocational rehab services and a new program to reimburse employers that accommodate disabilities. Uh, this might be one of the strongest bills uh, for supporting Minnesota workers with disabilities that the House uh, will be passing. Uh, at minimum, it recognizes that uh, workers with disabilities is an important part of relieving the worker shortage in our state. And this is how we um, operationalize equity in the workforce. The overwhelming majority of this um, amount goes to deed, but will also contain a $7 million uh, fund to the Department of Corrections for programs that provide instruction and employment opportunities for prisoners, uh, which is a bill that uh, Chair Noor uh, carried. Uh, this is a long overdue um, that we uh, ensure all those who wish to participate and remain contributing to civilized society are given the uh, opportunity and a chance of dignity and finding a meaningful job. This is a bill for Minnesotans. Uh, we're developing uh, businesses, uh, the workforce and community all at once from continuing to support child care initiatives in Greater Minnesota to community energy transition grants. This bill. Uh, helps fight the illusion of an us versus them mentality. Um, the state is stronger and we're all stronger. Uh, this bill will uh, help those close the uh, rural-urban divide and will rise up all Minnesotans. The big, biggest ticket item in this omnibus bill is a $30 million appropriation each fiscal year 24-25 for a package of competitive grant programs to encourage workforce targeted uh, workforce development uh, targeted for communities of color and low-income communities. Uh, we're making meaningful investments in people uh, and their social capital, and we're training youth into the workforce of tomorrow, and we're spearheading innovation and fostering uh, new leaders in business and labor force, and we're doing it in the greatest workforce development bill in Minnesota uh, leaders have ever envisioned, and I can't be more proud of to move this bill. Thank you, Representative Zhang. And would you... So I won't move the A15, but would you describe the A15 amendment for us too, please? The A15 is the Minnesota Resiliency Program uh, that was heard in our committee and uh, was also championed by Representative Ryer and Chair Jimmy Becker-Fenn. Uh, there was an oversight on my, my part where he forgot to include the bill in here, and so all this is just to make sure that the bill is included in this budget. Thank you. Great. So we'll go to discussion on both the A15 amendment and to the bill now. 
Any discussion to the bill or the amendment? Representative Scott. I guess I'll go. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Representative Zhang, a um, couple of questions here. I see there's 15 million appropriated the, for the drive for five um, initiative. Um, was that bill heard in your committee? It was. Representative Zhang. Thank, I'm sorry, Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. The bill was heard on the, um, our la at our last hearing with deed. Uh, Representative Zhang, would you just go a little louder or closer to the microphone? We heard the bill with deed at our last hearing. Representative Scott. Thank you. And um, there's $3 million to establish the new office, office of New Americans. Um, was that ever heard in the Workforce Committee? That, Representative Zhang. Madam Chair, that bill was heard in another committee, but it's through deed, so it's within our budget, if I recall correctly. Okay. Representative Scott. Thank you. And the Energy Transition Advisory Committee, was that heard in, your, in, in the Workforce Committee? Representative Jean. I believe so. Representative Scott. No, thank you, Madam Chair. According to my notes, it, it wasn't. Um, I'm just wondering, I know that Energy Transition Advisory Committee has been in existence for a while, and this is just kind of re-upping it. Um, are you familiar with any of the work product that's come out of that um, that committee? Representative Sean. I'm sorry, can you refer, can you, can you ask the question again? I wasn't, I was looking sure. at my CA. Sure. Representative Scott. Thank you, Madam Chair and um, Chair Jong. No, the, the Energy Transition Advisory Committee, um, that's been a committee that's been in existence this portion of your bill is just re-upping it. It's um, otherwise, I think it was going to sunset. This is re-upping it and, and putting more financing behind it. And I'm just wondering if you have any um, information on the work product that has come out of that committee so far, kind of a justification for renewing it. Representative Sean. Thank you, Madam Speaker. No, I don't believe this is, this was a representative Senator Muir's bill that we did here in committee. Representative Scott. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I'm just, I'm just, I guess I'll save that for the floor and, and the, the, the person, uh, uh, Representative Senator Maria on that because I have some questions about that committee Madam being Speaker. renewed. Um, the Office of New Americans, was that heard in your committee? Representative Zhang. Madam Speaker, no, again, this was a bill that was heard because it's, uh, I believe State Gulf was where the bill was heard. There was Representative Feist's bill, but it's also a program through DEED. Representative Scott. Thanks. Um, <coughs> I guess what I'm getting at, Madam Chair, is there are a number of provisions in this bill that weren't heard in your committee. They were heard in another committee, but they're in your bill. And so I just, I'm just, there's some other, the diversity and inclusion training for small employers, the public infrastructure project. Um, there's a, just a number of, of bills within the omnibus that weren't heard in your committee, but yet they're showing up in your, in your omnibus bill. So that um, gives me a little bit of concern, um, Madam Chair. Um, in the over the past here, when we've been hearing the omnibus bills, we've had this separate amendment that talks about following the uh, kind of sort of auditing the grant, the grant um, process, and re um, recipients of grants. And I don't see that amendment accompanying this bill I don't I'm just I don't know if that's a question for you or yeah that is and so we'll actually put it on when we merge the bills it'll go on as the last one that we'll cover so we didn't do it for the labor and we didn't do it for this but once we merge the bills we will put that on which will be the blanket for all okay of it. perfect yeah, so thank it you, will Madam go on Chair. Thank or you. I mean we will take it up okay yes thank you yeah thank you representative Hassan thank you madam chair um I just want to uh you know respond to what rep Scott's talking about some of the bills that uh, rep Scott referenced mm -hmm. are the governor's recommendations, the governor's bill was late. Uh, we didn't get the bill until I, I believe um, the second week, uh, I believe the second deadline. So uh, because of the revisor's office being really backed up, uh, some of this, you know, were not heard in committee because the bill was late, but we had deed come to the workforce committee and then give us an overview and highlight of what's in the governor's recommendations. 
Thank you, Representative Edelson. That's helpful. Representative Edelson. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Represent Representative Zhang. Um, I just want to thank you for the, the large investments that you make in technology and STEM in your bill. Um, Minnesota definitely, in, in, a, in conjunction with Representative Hassan's um, federal match on the CHIPS legislation, is going to put us in a really good place, so thank you for that. Further discussion to the bill? Representative Pinto. Thanks, Chair. And um, it's my understanding that the the provisions that were being asked about were in the bill when they left when they left committee. So I mean, the, the provisions were heard in the committee, right? I mean, it's not all that unusual for uh, for a chair to um, have provisions that are heard. Of course, there's I assume there's public testimony, and I mean, so the point is these provisions were in fact heard in the committee. They weren't heard before this budget bill was proposed by Representative Zhang, by Chair Zhang, but then they received testimony and there was a consideration and a vote. So they were actually all considered, at least as far as my understanding is. Thanks. Representative Scott. Oh, final words, Madam mm -hmm. Chair. I just wanted to respond to that. And I know that when we do omnibus bills, some stuff shows up that was never heard. But I'm talking about prior to being stuck in an omnibus bill. There's, I think I counted like seven or eight provisions that were just thrown in the omnibus bill before it left committee, but the bills didn't have individual hearings and go entirely through the process. And that's, that's what we do here. Um, I understand the governor's budget may have been late. That doesn't mean that the committee can't still um, hear the bills. We uh, make exceptions and um, outside of deadlines um, to hear to hear and vet bills properly. It's done quite frequently and it's the right thing to do um, rather than waiting for it, you know, all just to be thrown in an omnibus bill um, where um, on those days where the omnibus bills are heard, a lot of time public testimony is very limited in time. And so I just, um, I just think we could, we could do better as the, in the process. But <coughs> thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Further discussion, Representative Becker Finn. I, thank you, Madam Chair. And I, and I do just want to note for the record that um, I certainly in my years here have seen chairs do that, um, put things in at omnibus bill time that are not things that have been heard as standalone bills. I think one year uh, in the environment bill uh, under Chair Fabian, there were over 20 provisions that had not been seen as standalone bills. In this case, we actually have a reason why, and we're all being really upfront about why that's happening, and I just think that's important for the record. Thank you. Further discussion to House File 2233, or the A15 amendment. Representative Hassan. Thank you, Madam Chair. I want to thank uh, Jer Shang for um, being intentional and uh, working really hard to make sure that we um, reimagine our workforce. Uh, you know, our constituents have been coming to us telling us that there is a workforce crisis. Uh, we heard so many bills. I believe this was the one committee that there was uh, eight, nine bills at every hearing. Um, we heard from um, members from the urban court, suburban, greater Minnesota come to us and bring us workforce bills that are unique, that are exceptional, and um, creative on solutions on how to solve the workforce crisis that we're in. And um, I was, you know, very pleased to see Jer Shang just um, work extremely hard to make sure that uh, all these bills were included and many of the bills were heard and the governor's bill while it was late, we still had an overview. Uh, Rep Baker wouldn't let us off the hook easily. So we had an overview of all the bills that he had questions on. But what's unique about the workforce and the economic development uh, uh, um, committee this year is that it used to be one committee now that it's separated. So there were bills that were heard in my committee but ended up in Gershong's omnibus bill. So those bills were heard. They had a full hearing um, and we, you know, put them um, in his committee because the two committees, the lines overlap so much. So I believe what Rep. Scott was talking about with some of those bills that uh, the energy uh, uh, bill was heard in my committee. It had a full hearing um, and it was put in um, Jair Shang's um, um, omnibus bill because the two committees overlap. So um, I want to thank for your leadership, Jer Shang, and for being intentional about equity and for listening to Minnesotans across the state. Thank you. Thank you. 
Seeing no further discussion, I will go to Representative Zhang for final word on your bill. Well, I think uh, Chair Hassan just took my words I was going to share with uh, uh, with Representative Scott's concerns. And I assure you, Representative Scott, that uh, although some of these bills may not have heard in committee, they were very properly vetted. Um, and I know that uh, the same concerns you have for the governor's bill, I also had concerns too. That's why I asked them. I asked them persistently with Lee Baker, my Republican colleague who leads the Workforce Committee. Uh, we both were asking the governor's office, where is this deed bill? We would like to know what's in it. And I gave him a whole hour to around, I believe it was about an hour for us, for my members in that committee to ask uh, deed questions. And if you also have concerns, I'm more than happy to set up a meeting uh, with you and deed in the governor's office to uh, go over those concerns. Uh, that said, uh, members, I know that you all have a lot of things going on today, so I just want to thank you all and especially uh, the community for coming in uh, and uh, the workforce development members, all members uh, who had an input in crafting this bill. This is not my bill. This is the workforce development bill that was crafted for both Republican and Democrat uh, members in there. And so thank you so much for your time. Thank you for all your work, Representative Zhang. And I will note just the way the committee structures are, there is a lot of overlap in deed and with the budgets being split. And so we're seeing some of that. And that's hence why we will be combining to meet up with the structure in the Senate. And so I think some of that also has to do with some of the jurisdiction that's a little different than it has been in years past. And I think you and Chair Hassan have done a good job uh, working together in partnership. So thank you for your work on this bill, Representative Zhang. So with that, I move that House File 2233 be laid over. Thank you. And next up is Senate File 3035, Representative Hassan. And this is the Economic Development Budget Bill. And Representative Hassan, Hassan <coughs> you move that 20 file, 20, Senate File 3035 be placed on the General Register. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, did I move my that move I, the bill? You, if I, I just stated the motion for you as okay. long as you are the yes. motion would okay, great. Yes, so moved, Madam Chair. <laughs> it's it's too early. Yeah. <laughs> uh, late night last night. Yeah. Um so and then what we'll do, Representative Hassan, is you will also move to delete everything after the enacting clause and insert the language from House File thirty twenty eight, the first engrossment. Is that your motion? Yes, Madam Chair. Wonderful. And so why don't we take the vote on that to get the bill in the shape we need it to be, and then we will have you discuss it. So okay. all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say no. The motion prevails, and we have the language adopted. So please uh, describe your bill, Representative Hassan. Thank you, Madam Chair uh, and members. Um, this um, is the budget bill for the economic development. Um, like I said, the, Deed is divided into two committees, and I, I, I believe this is the first time, at least since I've been here, and uh, there's so much overlap with the workforce and the economic development. Um, I want to thank our um, nonpartisan staff for all the work that they did to make sure that um, not only do we understand the overlaps and jurisdictions, but also um, to craft a bill that, that we, Jer Zhang and I, are both happy with. I also want to um, thank my CA, Travis, who, um, while he has done this work for many years and worked with, uh, you know, uh, Deed for many years, I don't think he has worked uh, with two accounts. <laughs> uh, deed divided into two accounts. So there was a lot of confusion uh, around which uh, bills are supposed to be or which accounts are supposed to be in what committee. But he worked really hard. And then my CLA, uh, Elijah. Henderson, who was also amazing, and our DFL researcher, Dave Sullivan, um, and then also our, um, you know, Republican researcher, Laurie Casino, who was also amazing. Um, I also want to thank uh, my members in that committee who, um, especially uh, our lead Kasnick and my great vice chair, uh, Hansen, who, and all the members who have created a, a safe space to have a really uh, intentional conversation about equity. We started with our committee with uh, grounding ourselves in um, doing two things. First, we did labor and land acknowledgement. Um, and then uh, secondly, we did an overview um, presentation um, from 
Dr. Uh, Bruce Corey that t highlighted the disparities that exist um, in our state. Uh, so that was that grounded us in the reality that while you know some of us um, you know see Minnesota growing and uh, has, having a really strong economy, that that didn't that, that didn't mean that everybody was benefiting from that economy that we were leaving communities behind. The last three years has been challenging for our state and even more challenging for our small businesses with a pandemic that closed many of our doors and amplified our uh, inequities in our systems and put a lot of stress on all of us because we were uncertain of what our future was going to be, followed by the tragic murder of George Floyd and the civil unrest that destroyed the cultural corridors in our main cities. Um, I guess you can say our business, small businesses went through a lot. Uh, while the uh, murder of George Floyd was a tragic incident and heartbreaking one, I believe it shaped our state uh, and forced us to have really difficult conversations about systemic barriers, racism, and um, wealth inequities. Um, and it's my hope that we will continue to use this tragedy as a turning point to build a state that works for all of us, an inclusive society for all Minnesotans. According to research, Minnesota has the third largest racial wealth gap in the country, the second biggest uh, poverty rate gap in the nation at 291.78%, and the state's home ownership rate gap ranks fourth uh, largest in the nation, while the median household income is the fifth largest. Some of the key factors driving this racial wealth gap include uh, in unequal access to capital, more barriers to pursuing higher education and opportunities, um, higher education opportunities and underemployment, as well as generational gap that's far off for many people. Knowing all this, we had to be intentional about reducing disparities and creating opportunities, and we had to build a budget bill uh, that was transformational and that speaks for the persisting uh, systemic gaps that we had. This bill helps Minnesotans with emphasis on small businesses uh, by investing in the infrastructure of small business, creating access to capital and wealth building. This year's budget bill has, uh, budget bill has a special focus in intentional equity, creating tools to help people of color, women, veterans, L LGBTQI, people with dis disabilities, and everyone from the underrepresented groups in the business community to become a business owner. The biggest ticket on this bill is the $500 million we are using to attract um, federal dollars. Uh, we're calling it Minnesota Forward Fund, and um, the governor and um, deed and others uh, expect Minnesota to receive $2 billion uh, with this money. $300 million is to match at least uh, federal funds in the CHIPS Act uh, for microelectronic manufacturing facilities, and the $100 million is for the federal match for the um, Consolidated Appropriation Act passed in Congress in 2002 to establish a campus for biomanufacturing testing in Minnesota, and then $100 million to match for um, economic development projects. This, the reason why we're doing this is two things, to bring manufacturing back to Minnesota and also to um, not rely on China for everything. Uh, we're also spending money um, to rebuild our cultural corridors on our two main cities, Minneapolis and St. Paul. As you remember, the civil unrest destroyed many of those um, and we are replacing the Main Street Revitalization Program with a program called Empowering Enterprise um, that spends money on rebuilding those businesses that were impacted by the civil unrest. Um, we're creating uh, the Emerging Developers Account. As you guys know that um, in the developer world, if you don't have access to capital, relationships, and family wealth, it's really hard to break into that. Um, we're funding the initiative foundations at $6 million, each, one, uh, each initiative foundation uh, $1 million to uh, supplement their revolving um, loan programs. Um, and we are spending $5 million um, in case uh, the World Fair comes to Minnesota, and that's a hope that it's going to come to Minnesota in 2027. Um, we're spending money on the Canadian border relief. Um, we had uh, communities from uh, the Grand Portage come to us and tell us that 
they used to have 400,000 crossings before COVID. And then with Canadian border being closed, open, closed, open, that literally destroyed their small businesses in, in, in their small cities. And um, their uh, crossings are now 100,000. So they really need help. So we're um, spending $4 million in that. And then um, I could go on and on on how much money we're spending, uh, <laughs> but I wanna make sure that I give people a chance to ask questions. Uh, this bill funds DEED at its base funding, but we also increase uh, funding for Explore Minnesota tourism. As you guys know, t the tourism industry has really like t taken a hit. In, in the last four years, and we want to make sure that we can attract more people to come, uh, you know, visit and live Minnesota. And with that, Madam Chair, I believe that I highlighted most of the things in this bill, and I'll stand for questions. Thank you, Representative Hassan. Discussion to the bill. Representative Petersburg. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. And, and this really isn't a question as much as just a comment. I, I noticed that this. Um, a bill does expand a prevailing wage and I that's over the years has always been kind of a controversial issue and I do think that sometime uh, we should have another uh, discussion about prevailing wage itself I I'm just you know whereas prevailing wage is is a benefit to the employee it's not necessarily to the employer and and I would just like to comment that you know what if the federal government would say um, all contracts that have federal money involved with it has to have a national prevailing wage uh, cover to it. I think we would think that was unfair for us to have to have wages uh, comparative to um, the, the West Coast and the East Coast. Uh, when we have different uh, standard of living, we have different uh, costs related to it. And the same is true throughout the state. We do have regional uh, differences in, in lifestyle and um, and cost of livings and that makes a difference on on what is an equitable and fair wage not based upon statewide but by upon the area that have i know that's a controversial issue and we're not going to deal with it today but uh, this again has an expansion in which it really is a benefit to the employee and not to the employer and i think sometime we have to start figuring out how we can make that equitable for both the employer and employee uh, just my own comment madam chair representative o'neill Thank you, Madam Chair. Just really quick, sorry, I'm gonna move this so I can see you. If I always sit up here so I can see them. Um, so when I'm looking through the fiscal notes on this, I see that um, a very large appropriation is in the first year of the biennium for a couple entities, one being deed, the other one being in the category of business and community development. Um, it's substantially more than in the second year of the bay in which sets up our tails. And I'm just wondering if you could expand on um, what are some of the things that they look to me like one time funding because you don't carry it on into the second year of the biennium. Um, just can you talk briefly about that? Um, yeah, so it's deed. It was 695 million in the first year and 125 million in the second year. And under the category of business and community development, it was 691 million with 120 million in the tail. So they're substantially different, but obviously you're gonna be using that money for some period of time. Maybe it's four years, maybe it's longer. I'm not sure I haven't looked at all that and they might be all different. So if you could expound, expound on that, please. Representative Hassan. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Rep. Neal. Um, so according to our uh, chair of taxes, we were, <laughs> I remember hearing from Aisha that we're, we have a large amount of money but it's most of it is one-time funding. So this is why there is a large uh, money of one-time funding. Uh, and I believe the tails are very small, but um, since this is about deed, uh, deed is in the room. So if we wanna get Commissioner um, McKinnon to come up and just like comment on that, that would be great. Sure, Representative Hassan, and I will just say globally, you know, you, you can come up if you want, Commissioner that you know, within our budget targets, we obviously have our, our budget resolution that, that binds us for spending here in this biennium, but we also obviously sent the joint targets that were public <laughs> where we also have the, the spending in the tails, which to Representative Hassan's point, we all know we had uh, more money in the surplus in this biennium than we do next, so our chairs had to be very cognizant of you know setting up one-time appropriations, which I'm sure Representative Hassan did quite a bit of as we looked through the bill and could name a number of those things as we walked through, but 
that those probably pop out in the spreadsheet where we can see where there's funding in this biennium that's not. And I think that's probably a theme for most of our chairs that had to deal with that this uh, this this we're going through this process. So, but we can have uh, maybe Commissioner McKinnon comment on that as well. So, Commissioner McKinnon, welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the record. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair and members. Kevin McKinnon, I'm the temporary commissioner uh, of Deed. And um, in response to uh, Representative O'Neill's uh, question, yeah, the majority of the first year funding, uh, 500 million of it, uh, is obviously the forward fund, one time uh, funding, uh, obviously, for economic development match. Uh, moving forward, uh, there are a number of other provisions that, uh, yes, in the first year are. Um, are funded at higher levels. Um, generally, how it works uh, is uh, we we normally have two years to spend uh, most of that money. Uh, in some cases, it will extend out uh, beyond the, beyond the two years as well. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for that. Yeah, yes, I, you know, I mean, I've looked at a few budget bills in my time, so. I know the energy bill, for example, extended out nearly 10 years to be able to appropriate that, you know, use the money up, and it was, it just sat there in a, a revenue account. So, would you say that the 500 million then is going to be expended in two years for deed, or did you? Is there some extension past the two years? Commissioner McKinnon, <clears throat> Madam Chair, Representative O'Neill, um, <clears throat> the way that the fund is set up and. Uh, uh, primarily uh, for the CHIPS Act, as an example, semiconductor uh, companies will be applying to the federal government for uh, funding. They should know um, uh, relatively quickly whether their applications are accepted by the federal government uh, and as such uh, then would come to us. And generally a building project for a semiconductor plant, as an example, can take um, 12 to 24 months for sure. Um, and the way that this funding works is it's reimbursement based. So it may sit there beyond the two years, uh, but it certainly would be encumbered before that um, in order to continue to pay it. Uh, some of the other um, uh, uh, projects within the forward fund, uh, the hope would be yes, that the sooner we could spend those resources, the better. Uh, we want private investment. We obviously want to leverage the, the federal money. Um, in some cases, it may take a little longer to um, develop um, property uh, if that is one of the um, uses <clears throat> that uh, comes with the fund that can leak out a few more years, uh, but generally I would expect um, definitely that this would be spent within four. That would be the hope. Uh, I don't, we don't want to sit on that cash any, any longer than we need to. We want to get that out there. We want to get private investment rolling along with leveraging the federal money. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Representative Hassan, how is it structured in the bill? I mean, I understand what Deed is saying. I appreciate that. I understand 500 million, they're trying to get it out as fast as they can. It'll be encumbered, but not spent. But what does the language of the bill say as far as that money uh, of large infusion of money up front? Is it going into a special revenue account? Is it gonna sit there for two years, four years, 10 years? Like, can you just give us the basic, I mean, we're in finance, a basic structure of how that finance is gonna flow? Representative Hassan. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and I believe that the commissioner just tried to explain what we're doing. Um, the idea is that we are going to attract federal dollars and bring manufacturing back to Minnesota. And, you know, if we can get this money as fast as possible to companies who want to spend it, that would be fantastic. Uh, but it's my understanding that um, the language came from Deed and the governor. So. <laughs> Uh, and that's exactly the way that it's in the bill. Commissioner McKinnon. Yeah, Madam Chair, Representative O'Neill, uh, yes, there would be a special revenue uh, fund for this. Thank you. <laughs> um, however, <clears throat> the way our, our initial bill, uh, the way that we have envisioned this is there could be a series of grants, loans um, uh, for uh, projects. Whether loans is actually one of the 
uh, final uh, negotiated items uh, would be a question mark. That's what you would need that special revenue fund uh, for to recover that money and then put it back into into uh, into projects. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair. I didn't mean for this to go down a whole long rabbit trail, but I. I thought I was asking simple questions. Okay, so help me understand. So you are putting the 500 million into a special revenue account, which means that it stays there until it is spent. So it's not canceling back to the general fund. Some of it will be used for loans. So that's kind of a revolving pool of money. Can be, because you said you loan it out, you get it back in, it goes back into the special revenue account. Okay, so that's half of it, Madam Chair. I'm wondering about the other half, which is unless the other 500 million also goes to D, but it's under the category of business and community <coughs> development. If that's also under the purview of D, I'm not sure. It looks but like that's Commissioner McKinnon separate. knows the answer. So Commissioner McKinnon. Uh, Madam Chair, Representative O'Neill, I used to be the executive director of business community development, so I know exactly what that is. Uh, that's a division within uh, deed that essentially holds uh, the funding from the appropriation. Uh, what that funds is a series of programs between uh, our Office of Business Finance, our Community uh, Finance Office, our Small Business Office, and our Small Business, De our, uh, Small Business Development Office, and our Office of Business Development. So within there, you've got a series of programs and grants. Uh, business finance, as an example, the Minnesota Investment Fund, the Job Creation Fund, community finance is your redevelopment account, small businesses are SBDCs, and those those types of things. There are also a variety of um, uh, appropriations that come to deed uh, that this unit would also manage. So this is where the funds that flow uh, through deed to nonprofit organizations, as an example, for business technical assistance. That's where uh, this money also resides. Representative O'Neill. I'm sorry, Madam Chair. This just brings up more questions. <laughs> okay. Um, so the business and community development um, it's, it's again, it's another additional $500 million one time money because it's not in the even second year, so it's not setting up a base. And it's going to job creation. And so, all these different funds I've heard of many, I used to serve on the jobs committee, right. so with uh, then Chair Groffalo. So, I, I'm familiar with all that. But again, um, is this also going to a special revenue account and so it will be there until it's expended or is it going to cancel back to the general fund? Um, and how much of that, the other question is, how much of that then goes to directly to nonprofits, if you happen to know that number? Commissioner McKinnon. Madam Chair, Representative O'Neill, uh, no, generally in uh, appropriations to the business community development uh, uh, division, uh, are generally following the two-year uh, provision. There are some uh, programs within that budget that do have available until spent. Uh, our Minnesota Job Skills Partnership, our Minnesota Investment Fund, et, ce et cetera. Um, but generally, all of those funds are going to be uh, for, the, for the biennium. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair. That that does help. Um, I'm just trying to bring some clarity, and I'm trying to stay as high level as I can. But um, yeah, it's I, I don't serve on that committee anymore, so I don't have the background. I appreciate that. Um, okay, the last question I'll ask, and then I'll let some of my colleagues ask this. I really wasn't trying to go, you know, difficult questions. I I, I don't know. Ms. O'Neill, you're within the bounds of fiscal <laughs> stuff. It's on a spreadsheet. I think that is. You're, you don't have to apologize. Oh, thank you, Madam <laughs> Chair. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, okay, so the I have a question for the author, if, if she would happen to know, and maybe if she doesn't, maybe your um, testifier might. So do you happen to know the split between Metro, the seven county Metro and non-Metro as far as money that is appropriated directly to, um, directly for grants? For example, the um, Empowering Enterprise Program, it's specific money for the city of Minneapolis. It looks like it's $62 million. Another Empowering Enterprise Program for the city of St. Paul, which is $22 million. Um, when I add up things that I could see real quickly in the spreadsheet as far as Seven County Metro, I came up with $304 million directly. And I'm wondering, um, do you happen to have a breakdown? Typically, so, you know, I used to serve on the jobs committee. So typically you do a, an equal split between greater Minnesota and the seven county Metro. Sometimes 
the metro is defined differently, obviously, but can do you happen to know the the balance between the Savitt County Metro and Greater Minnesota for um, in, in this bill? Specifically, don't uh, designate for them. Representative Hassan. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, Rep O'Neill. I believe the uh, empowering enterprise is specifically for rebuilding city of Minneapolis and city of St. Paul in af the aftermath of George Floyd and the civil unrest um, for that money. Uh, but we're also spending uh, money on uh, greater Minnesota. And I don't know if the commissioner wants to highlight what the deeds programs are, but I know that um, we're spending, you know, um, the, uh, just a second, I gotta look at my, I don't want to make up stuff. <laughs> the Initiative Foundations, um, um, this, the $6 million that we're um, uh, funding for Initiative Foundations, that's uh, for uh, Greater Minnesota. Uh, the Canadian Border Relief is also Greater Minnesota. Um, and I also believe the um, small business um, the business partnership is also uh, focused on Greater Minnesota, and I also um, know that um, MIRA, as well as um, um, NDC, which is Neighborhood Development, are also uh, focused on Greater Minnesota. Um, they both have like sites in Greater Minnesota that are focused on, um, you know, helping small businesses. So um, we were intentional about making sure that we we fund Greater Minnesota as well as uh, the Metro. Uh, but the one big ticket is for rebuilding businesses that were impacted in, in Minneapolis and St. Paul. But I'll let the commissioner highlight some of the uh, deed stuff that are funding Greater Minnesota. Do, you, do the uh, Rep. Commissioner McKinnon, and I'd say there's a lot in here just as a Greater Minnesota member too. The child care, there's things that probably even aren't explicitly listed as Greater Minnesota, but have a larger impact in Greater Minnesota because of the need, and I see child care as one, as, as many other areas too, but Commissioner McKinnon. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair uh, and Representative O'Neill. Uh, Madam Chair is correct. Uh, there are a variety of programs, obviously, that we um, administer that uh, Greater Minnesota relies on. Uh, there are also a variety of programs like our public infrastructure program, uh, uh, some of our job training programs that are only for uh, Greater Minnesota um, uh, organizations. Uh, generally, um, th historically, uh, from a deeds perspective, we've uh, generally put more money into Greater Minnesota just based on uh, various appropriations that happen through bonding bills and through uh, through spending bills. We be happy to get you those breakdowns. Um, I've, we were just looking at them the other day. Uh, as it relates to um, uh, uh, Representative Hassan's bill, um, there are a variety of, of provisions there in which we have significant relationships with a lot of organizations uh, through a variety of programs who are based in Greater Minnesota. We've got a great relationship, obviously, with the Initiative Foundations, uh, the folks in Rochester, um, folks uh, up on uh, in, in the Northeast, uh, the Entrepreneur Fund, as an example, uh, who do a lot of uh, business outreach and business technical assistance. Uh, and so there, there are a variety of programs like that as well uh, that are within this bill uh, that definitely will be, uh, be utilized by um, uh, businesses in Greater Minnesota. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you for all of that. I really was just looking for kind of a, a bottom line number. I, I just happened to add up what I could see quickly, which was $304 million specifically to the seven county metro um you said you had just looked at a spreadsheet um maybe you don't have that information you could provide it to us later or something because it it's just something that being on the jobs committee for many years it it's something that we took very seriously that we tried to balance the um the attention that each portion of the state got they have very different needs and we recognize that and you know I appreciate there are specific programs specifically for greater Minnesota because they have specific needs but I'm asking specifically in this bill what is the balance uh, just to, you know top number line of it's 304 maybe it's even more than that just to the seven county metro how much 
304 million, how much is it for greater Minnesota in this bill? That, that would, and maybe they don't have an answer today. I don't know, Madam Chair. Commissioner McKinn, we can certainly get back to you because I think it's probably a deeper dive than what's just on the surface of the bill titles, but I could go to Representative Hassan or Commissioner McKinnon if you have a number you'd want to do now or get back or comments, Representative Hassan. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I don't think we sat down and calculated. Here is for what we're spending on the metro. Here is what we're spending for Greater Minnesota because we do not want that divide. Uh, but we were intentional of making sure that every bill that came through our committee, that our members brought, that our you know um, that was um, a need for Minnesota businesses that was highlighted. I think we are the only committee that can say we heard every bill that that uh, was sent to our committee and we funded every bill. So, I mean, I don't know the number, the exact number, but I think that um, our staff can, you know, come up with a number for you and send it to you because no one sat down and said that, are we spending dollar by dollar? How much are we spending on Greater Minnesota? How much are we spending in the Metro? But we're intentional in making sure that we spend money from the Canadian border to South Minneapolis. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, it, Again, it wasn't supposed to be a tough question. It's something that we talk about a lot. At least when I was on the jobs committee, we talked about it a lot, just this balance. Um, okay, so I only have one other question and it, it probably pertains more to when we put the bills together, um, but I'll just put it out there so people can think about it. Uh, so the whole uh, report back about nonprofits, Madam Chair, that we're gonna add later. Um, I have a question about and you and maybe I will address it to Chair Hassan because you did mention it that you heard every bill and you funded every bill. And my question really is: so after all of these funds go out, will there be then a follow-up committee hearing, whether it's next session, next biennium, to check to see how that money was used and kind of get a report back to the legislature? I think we do. A bit of that, probably not nearly enough to hear back, especially when th something's in the base, we just sort of fund it and just kind of go on, but we don't get a lot of reports back. Is that an intention of yours is to hear back from the various, you said you funded every bill, so all those various organizations and nonprofits and, and whatever was funded, will they come back to your committee and report back to what they did with the money? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, rep Thank you, Madam Chair, Rep O'Neill. Um, when I said we funded every bill, I meant that in a much more positive way because people came to us with a great need. Uh, our small businesses were bleeding, they were hurting uh, with COVID and um, you know, civil unrest and everything that has happened in the last three years really impacted our businesses, whether it's Greater Minnesota or the Metro. And um, it's my understanding that DEED has really extensive reporting. And we also plan to add um, another amendment to just make sure that if there is anything that DEED has missed that we're going to cover it. Um, but I would love to hear back from many of these uh, projects that we're funding because we're funding because we believe in these projects. We're funding it because we think it's a, there, there's a need for it. So. It'll be an honor for me to just hear back from this, um, you know, communities and just hear the work that was done um, under our leadership. But I, I want to give the commissioner to just highlight this reporting. Commissioner McKinnon. Uh, Madam Chair, Representative O'Neill, um, as part of the grants management process, we're required um, basically to close out grants. Uh, and when we do that, uh, we certainly um, have reports on every grant that we do. Uh, and we roughly do 1,500 grants, uh, uh, particularly in the economic development area um, over the last couple of years, uh, primarily around uh, the COVID uh, uh, circumstance, but uh, generally we're between you know, 500 and 1,500 grants. Uh, and every one of them, uh, once they are closed, uh, and have spent all the money, uh, certainly we have uh, the outcomes for that and would be happy to provide that. There are various programs. Uh, in fact, I'm looking at Darielle, maybe 35 or 40 that have reports. Um, all of the individual appropriations 
would probably be more of what I was just saying from when we close out the grants, that's where you could get the the outcomes and, and how the money was used, et cetera. Thank you, Madam Chair. Further discussion? Representative Scott. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and um, thank you to Representative Hassan and to um, the commissioner for being here. Um, just to expound on Representative O'Neill's last question there, that was going to be one of my questions, was what kind of follow-up happens. Could you give us an insight on, on what metrics you look at in that reporting or um, in, uh, before you can close out the grants? Commissioner McKinnon. Uh, Madam Chair uh, and Representative Scott, um, the, when, when there's an appropriation, whether it's uh, through an existing program or when it's an appropriation from the legislature, um, we have basically an application process. The grantee will tell us, uh, if we're not that familiar with it, will tell us what, they, what their project is, what they will use the money for, how many people they will serve, uh, how they'll spend the money, um, and then the outcomes. Uh, generally from, uh, I'll just use business technical assistance as an example, generally you're looking at um, uh, the strength and capacity of the business. So were you able to leverage financing as a result of the technical assistance? So, so those are the types of things that we would be negotiating with, uh, with many of the grantees in order to enter into a contract. Once we enter into a contract, uh, then um, we manage to the budget that's created uh, through the contract um, and then continuously monitor uh, our grantees. Uh, and the way that it works is it's, it's always reimbursement based. Uh, so they have to spend the money, they have to do what they say they're going to do, uh, and then we will reimburse them. Thanks, Scott. Um, thank you, Madam Chair and Commissioner. Um, I'm assuming then, I mean, it's going to vary what the outcomes are and what is measured depending on who the grantee is. Um, so what I'm observing here in this bill and with many others that are moving, so I'll, I'll just focus on this bill, I guess, because you're, you're the deed commissioner. Um, so there's an awful, there's a big expansion of, of grants in this bill, a l very large expansion. So there's going to require a whole lot more oversight. And so does um, DEED have the staff to, to do that kind of work? Commissioner McKinnon, and I think we'll do this, but I think this could be a relevant conversation for kind of every place, and he's in the hot seat right now. So we'll, we'll allow for a little bit of this, but I think you know a larger conversation around grant management could happen and probably does need to happen, and I don't think that all needs to happen within the context of this bill today. But... Being he is here, and if you wouldn't mind, Commissioner McKinnon. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, Representative Scott. Um, to your question, does DEED have the staff uh, uh, in order to implement uh, this bill? Uh, generally, uh, from uh, the economic development um, portion or economic development part of DEED, um, uh, a lot of these provisions, um, uh, yes, generally uh, there are um, staff that would fund the programs to do uh, a lot of the work. The additional programs that are coming on, um, I, I don't have the exact number uh, related to economic development just off the top of my head, but uh, we would need to add staff. Uh, uh, as a result of this um, through um, uh, a number of different programs, but uh, not to the extent of, uh, I, I think in economic development, I just, I think it's around 20 um, maybe staff that we, that we would need. Some of those are more temporary um, uh, as a result of the one-time funding. Um, some of them are funding existing staff uh, as well, or FTEs that are already existing, and and you program the the administration that way. Um, and and so it's not a large expansion of it, but like 
you're hearing from your constituents, uh, like you probably hear from others. Um, we're trying to attract uh, people. We're hiring right now um, for a variety of positions, uh, and um, and we will do our best, uh, obviously, to implement uh, what the legislature appropriates to deed uh, as quickly, as efficiently, and as accurately as possible. Representative Scott. Thank you, Madam, Ch Madam Chair. And so since this is the finance, uh, the last stop as far as finances, Representative Hassan, have have you built in that, you know, 20 employee need that they're going to have? Have you built that into this budget? Representative Hassan. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, yes, Rep. Scott. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Scott. Uh, um, I know that we're going to be combining this bill, and I'll just make some comments now. That's, sure. that's not necessary later, mm -hmm. but... And I know we're going to adopt that the the one amendment again yet still, but um, just to move things along, um, I, I feel like the combination of this bill, these bills is um, there are some good provisions. There are some good provisions, and I think there are some aspects of this combined bill that will help um, uh, the people of Minnesota, both the employees and the employers. I, I do have great concerns about um, some of the board, the board that's being set up with the nursing homes. I feel like this doesn't go far enough um, in that, it, to, well, it, it oversteps um, in regard to the nursing home um, situation. In other ways, I feel like it's harmful to businesses because um, it's putting more regulation in place and it's, it's um, broadly and um, it's, it just seems to be um, an unbalanced bill. It seems to be um, focused on um, empowering unions versus um, a balance there between um, the employees and the employer. And um, I, I won't be supporting the bill today. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, for the question. Thank you. Great. Seeing no further discussion, I will go to Representative Hassan for the final word on your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, members, for the discussion. And thank you, Rep. O'Neill, for um, your questions. Like uh, the chair said, you didn't need to apologize. You are within your realm of uh, just curiosity of what this bill does. Uh, this is a great bill. We heard from uh, our constituencies uh, all of the state of Minnesota and uh, their needs in um, helping continue supporting small businesses and this is the response to that um, request. So I hope you can support this bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Hassan, for all your work. And I was struck, I know I could, we could comment on all the budget bills, but you know, when we talk about equity, we think about it kind of in, I think, a flat way. And I think your bill really highlights equity in kind of every way we can measure it as a state and just really commend you for taking that into account from all the lenses, whether it be Greater Minnesota, whether it be whatever, and I think you did a great job really reflecting that. Um, so thank you for that. And so now we'll have a series of motions and votes to merge the Labor Workforce Development Economic De Development Budget Bills. So first will the A23-0116 amendment. So this is the Workforce Development, Econo workforce development and Economic Development Language. So Representative Hassan moves the Delete Everything Amendment coded A23-0116, which will insert the combined language from the Economic Development and Workforce Budget Bills into Senate File 3035. So that is the motion. Representative Hassan, is that your motion? Yes, that's my motion, Madam Chair. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say no. 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 We have to amend that, so hold the line. So that is the motion. We're, I will restate the motion, then I will move the amendment. So Representative Hassan has moved the Delete Everything Amendment coded A23-0116. There is an amendment to that, the A15 Amendment. And that is the one that I had uh, Representative Zhang describe earlier. So Representative Hassan moves the A15 Amendment to the DE, which is Representative Zhang's author's amendment. All those in favor of the A15 amendment to the DE, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say no. 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 The motion prevails and the A15 amendment to the DE is adopted. So to the DE, now we have one more amendment to that. 
So Representative Hassan moves the A-16 amendment to the DE, which is the grant management uh, amendment. So Representative Hassan, do you move the A-16 amendment to the DE? That's my motion, Madam Chair. Any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say no. The motion prevails in the A-16 amendment to the DE amendment is adopted. So now Representative Hassan renews her motion to adopt the A23-0116 amendment as amended. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say no. No. The motion prevails. And the A23-0116 amendment as amended has been adopted. Okay, so now we have one more thing to do here. <laughs> Um, before we vote. So, Representative Hassan, would you move that the language in House File 2755, as amended, be incorporated into the Economic Development, Workforce Development, and Labor Budget Bill as separate articles? So moved, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Hassan. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say no. 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 The motion prevails and the bills have been merged. So now we have all of the bills merged, all of the amendments adopted. So we have our final motion of the day now. Representative Hassan renews her motion that Senate file 3035 as amended be placed on the general register. Any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say no. no. The motion prevails and Senate file 3035 as amended has been placed on the general register. So that concludes our business for today. We are not meeting tomorrow, but we will be meeting Thursday and Friday at 9 a.m. And also likely, we will be meeting Monday and will likely be at 9 a.m. as well. Um, so with that, we are adjourned. <laughs>